All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, before our regularly scheduled uh, Board of Education meeting uh, tonight, we do have our uh, budget hearing. Uh, so we will start with that uh, this evening. So I'll call, call to order the budget hearing for the Papillion Vista Community Schools Board of Education for September 12, 2022. Section 1, call to order item A. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you all. Uh, roll call, please. Present. Here. Present. Here. Here. Thank you. I'll point out that the uh, open meetings law is uh, posted here at the entrance to the boardroom. Again, public comments uh, can be made at the conclusion of the hearing. Again, uh, when called upon, uh, come to the podium. Please state your name and address for the record. Comments of an individual may not exceed three minutes. Total time for all individuals who wish to speak shall not exceed 30 minutes unless a majority vote of the board approves extending the allocated time. All right, I will turn it over to Mr. Richards now for the budget hearing. All right, good, every, good evening, everyone. I apologize for my voice. I've got some allergies going, and I'm on steroids and everything else, so I, you know, I'll be nice and alert for you tonight, but my voice is kind of fading. Um, just to kind of recap the budget timeline first, uh, it's a little bit of a new cycle this year. Uh, tonight, we're at the budget hearing at 6 p.m., and then uh, the tax hearing notice will be published in the Papillion Times uh, next week. Um, we do have the new Sarpy County tax hearing scheduled at 6.05 at Papillion La Vista South High School Auditorium uh, next week. Um, September 26th, the district tax hearing will have that same uh, presentation here in the building uh, that we're at tonight, and then a budget resolution approval at that regular meeting. And then October 10th, it'll be about two weeks later than normal, uh, we'll have the tax resolution for the board to consider. Um, funds within the PLCS district budget. So when we're talking about state budget, each district uh, has to look at their different categories that they're going to budget within a school year. So we, do, we uh, budget in four different budget areas. General, which is our operations, that's the most budget we use. Uh, depreciation funds, so that's a fund that we transfer money to from the general so we can do things that depreciate, like technology, books, those types of things. Uh, the bond fund, which is used for principal and interest of bond payments. The special building fund, which you spend out of to do any necessary facility projects across the district, uh, including um, actually bond uh, projects that we pay out of there. Um, the activities is run mostly at the high schools uh, for their accounts and their in and outs, uh, gates and all those things. Uh, school nutrition, of course, runs kind of off to the side of everything else going on with their own budget and their own staff uh, paid through that account. And then we have a cooperative budget, uh, which we utilize for our English language learner programs and to some extent uh, with Ralston Public Schools. Uh, so we have a cooperative program there. And then student fees uh, are just in and out account for the student fees that we take in and then we spend out of. General fund highlights of this particular budget. Uh, we'll have a budget increase uh, proposed at 2.8%. Um, there's some recoding of these items. This is, uh, you know, my first real budget that I've been through since I came on July 1st last year. And Terry Staub, who's our director of uh, business services, has been outstanding in helping develop the budget. That's her, one of her first times through it as well. Uh, so there were a few things that we thought we'd want to switch around that makes more sense within the budget uh, that we pay. And I'll get into that here in a little bit. And in the recoding, the main thing you'll see is the district liability and workman's comp insurance uh, moves into the fiscal business services area versus being spread out uh, throughout the um, line items. Federal budget remains higher uh, due to ESSER three expenditures. Um, we keep that budget authority available. We'll do, we'll do that for ESSER three until the end, uh, which would be that 2024 year when it all has to be spent. An estimated 86% of our district spending is in that salaries and benefits and personnel. Um, it includes previous board approved areas and staffing uh, that we did in the winter and spring uh, with Dr. Settles. and includes pay increases in board approved areas of certified and classified staff. 
to give you a summary here, um, you can see the instruction is at 1.24%, but we took that uh, about 1.1 million out of that uh, line item of the liabil district's liability and workman's comp insurance. That's about 1.6 million a year we pay for that. So we took that out. Uh, so if we had that 1.1 million in, we'd be about 2.8% in spending within the instruction category. So that's why that doesn't look like it probably should be up enough. Um, summer school stays the same. We, we spend well below that uh, during summer school. Um, and you'll see in the support services, uh, the pupil and the special ed. Um, we ran right up against our budget this year, so we increased that a little bit. We are expecting some um, expenditures in the visually impaired areas especially. Uh, to increase in that particular budget line item. So we did take that up almost 9%. I don't think we'll be at the 4.7 million, but uh, just to be safe in case we have some move-ins or things like that that we need extra services for, we budget a little higher in that area. <clears throat> um, Board of Education, uh, same thing. There was about $140,000 budgeted in the Board of Education line for the liabil district's liability insurance. So just to make it cleaner, move it all 1.6 million of that payment into fiscal business services uh, which does include HR and communications budget, and then that took the Board of Education budget down to $100,000 uh, for the year. And that, that just includes things, uh, you know, for fee, dues and fees in the district, uh, part, pay, partial pay for lobbyists, uh, those types of things within that Board of Education budget. We all know you don't make any money, uh, so we do point that out <laughs> within the budget here. So that's a big change there. Um, district legal services, uh, we went right around 88 1,600, I think, this year in district legal services. Uh, so we took that budget up about 5,000 just to make sure we had enough authority in there uh, if, if needed. Um, again, that fiscal service is the reason for that jump. Spread, spread transportation, uh, we're worried about fuel costs there um, big time. I, I, you know, if it stays, if it keeps going down like it's going down, it shouldn't be a big deal. But again, just to budget enough to make sure we're covering uh, what we need to cover within that area uh, is important. State programs, the grants, those are actually grants within a district uh, that we qualify for, and they're given through the state to the district, and those are up uh, about 11%, which is good news, because uh, that's, that's money that we can use within our budget for sure. Um, and then transfer from general fund, it's just there if needed. Uh, we can decide uh, down the line to transfer as much as a million to depreciation again or uh, do a little bit more this time if we feel like we're, our spending is at a good point. But overall, the biggest number in the whole chart is in the bottom right-hand corner, the 2.8% increase in overall budget. Summary of general fund revenue changes. I'll say, so valuation increase of 9% uh, due to new commercial properties, residential development, strong home sales in the community. With that, and we always try to emphasize this because uh, a lot of even state senators down in Lincoln don't understand this. When your valuation goes up, your resources and then your state aid goes down, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, when you're trying to lower property taxes for patrons across the state like we've been talking at the legislature for a long time. But this is what happens. Uh, our state aid decreases. It's almost $2.5 million decrease, 7.1%. So I'd like to point out overall revenue increases in state aid and property taxes, really we're looking for about 3.29% of an increase in revenue uh, out of those two big pockets. Uh, so those are two of our biggest pockets that we get for our revenue. Probably 85% of our revenue comes from those two things. Um, the administration, we with the wage increases and a few personnel uh, increases, uh, we expect about a 3.4% increase in general fund spending in 2022-23 even though we're only increasing the budget 2.8%, how do we do that? Budgets are higher than spending. Uh, depreciation fund, uh, budget of available resources. Again, uh, I don't expect to spend all 2.8 million of that money, but it is available in case it's needed uh, for ongoing technology replacement. Bond fund, uh, again, used for paying principal interest and fees associated with bond annual payments. It doesn't pay for any of the building projects, so it's kind of difficult to understand uh, is a public member of the public, um, but anticipated payments for principal and interest this year of eighteen million seven hundred twenty nine thousand three hundred eighteen in in twenty two twenty three. Um, good news is bond three does drop off this year. Uh, we'll make our last payment here in December uh, for that particular bond three. 
Special building fund, so we're, we're a budget of $23,844,519. That does include building projects from bond proceeds, so uh, we're not out there um, you know, spending a lot of money out of this account that hasn't been approved by the voters. Uh, the budget allows for the remaining bond projects at La Vista West, Rumsey Station, Team Meeting Room, Liberty, uh, Papillion La Vista High School, and other remaining projects that were approved by the board to continue. And then we have a tax asking within our build, special building fund uh, that was brought back to the district once the learning community con le common levy went away. Uh, it allowed the district to build back up its building fund for things like uh, HVAC and air control systems. Uh, we talked about elementary and junior high irrigation projects that we still need to do and then other needed facility improvements uh, throughout the district. Other funds budgeted, uh, you know, the activities uh, fund, we budget about $3.5 million for hoping that we won't go over that. I think we went to about 2.6 million this year, so we're pre pretty comfortable budgeting 3.5. School nutrition, that's gonna be up from a year ago. Um, we have a, a budget there of about 7.5 real uh, spending in that school nutrition, so we need to keep that up in case school food prices continue to go higher than that. Uh, that's where we think we'll be around 7.5, but uh, just to be safe to budget, because you don't wanna overspend any of these uh, auxiliary budgets. Uh, cooperative learning, uh, $192,357. And then student fees with the in and out, we feel pretty comfortable at the thousand fifty thousand or a million fifty thousand mark. Good news is uh, with the it doesn't go dollar for dollar on the um, on the levy. I mean the it doesn't go dollar for dollar, so we do get to decrease uh, two cents throughout the budget because of that valuation increase. Uh, so the general fund will drop a little bit more than a cent. The bond fund will drop a little bit more than a cent with the valuation increase. And then the special building fund uh, stays about the same. So we're looking at over a two-cent decrease. What you see in the next slide is one of our best uh, decreases we've had in quite a while in the last six years, uh, which is really good news. And, and all this is really, I think, for people to really uh, take a look at is when the common levy went away back in 2016-17. Uh, that opened up some opportunities for um, the levy to decrease a little bit. It still isn't exactly a fair system when you get that type of valuation increase that you can't lower your property taxes accordingly. Um, but, you know, that's always a consideration down in Lincoln, trying to get that figured out, and they just haven't done it yet. So with that, with any questions you might have, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Or thinking if you have any uh, comments or whatever, we do have one public comment regarding the budget hearing. So again, I'll open it back up for any further comments or discussion. Oh, it's not close enough. It's green. I, it's, green. it's just not. It's not as loud. There we go. Okay. Uh, uh, up for public comment this evening uh, in regards to the budget hearing, uh, Miss Lone Eby. Hello, my name is Lowen Eby. I reside at 1401 Edgewater Circle, Papillion, Nebraska, 68046. Um, what I did was I went to the Auditor of Public Accounts under the political subdivisions, and I did an analysis of the budgets that our district has submitted from the last five years. And so I have handouts that I'll give you guys, but um, my question is this. So our valuations have increased significantly, and so my table shows the valuations from the last five years and then the percentage change. And our tax ask, so um, although the, um, the presentation showed a, um, the percentages, that's, um, that's good. However, but if you look at it from real dollars, um, our tax ask, the compounded annual rate has increased by 7% from the last, um, from the last, you know, for the last five years. And then on my table, what I did was I looked at, um, so the tax requirement change from the school year of 2020 to 2021 and then the last school year, our tax ask was $7.4 million. And then what I did was I went to the uh, RSP enrollment and our enrollment is declining. 
So when you guys are reviewing the budgets and voting to approve it, I would like for you to consider um, this information because um, I, I guess I just need a better understanding of we are asking for a significant um, tax requirement. However, our enrollment is declining. So I'm not sure how, how that works out. But, um, but yeah, I just wanted you to consider that when you are looking at the, you know, approving the budgets. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. All right, I see no further public comment. Uh, comments or questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Richards, I just want to thank you and the staff for uh, I know what is not an easy job of digging into the funds and, and uh, trying to project out for next year, especially with some of the inflation numbers that we've seen and the cost increases that we've seen over the last number of months. Trying to uh, figure out where they're going to end up isn't always easy, so thanks to, for going through that. Um, I know one of the – we have been improving some of the, the different groups and their pay increases, uh, and maybe this is a better question for Dr. Sales. Uh, can you remind me what the percentage increases were for some of those employee groups that we've approved so far for next year? So I'd probably have to get out my notes to make sure that I'm spot on on it. But um, for next year, our or for this year, our paras were around an 8.98 percent increase, and next year's around 4 percent increase. Um, clerical this year was a percentage increase. However, next year is a cent increase of uh, 70 cents per hour. Gotcha. And I mean, right now it's just needing to stay competitive in the market and right. making sure that we are offering, you know, compensation levels to make sure that our schools are staffed. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So we're um, currently with teacher negotiations coming up, as we always do in those years. Um, we are taking part in a comparability study, and PLEA will do the same thing um, so that we can uh, compare ourselves to other like districts. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. And uh, Mrs. Richard, thanks again for talking through the state aid decrease as a uh, uh, that comes in and hits you if your property valuations are increasing. As I know I get the question all the time. Well, yeah, you dropped the the levy or you kept the levy flat, yeah, but my um, property taxes are actually going up. You know, the nine percent or last year wasn't quite that high, but still going up. Uh, so I think the the drop in the state aid is what people don't see on the back end when we see those valuations go up, and I think it's just important to get that information out there more. Uh, so thanks for calling that out as well. You bet, and we'll try to do that. I know Dr. Rickley's got the task of next Thursday night because I'm going to be out of state, but uh, appreciate him stepping in. But uh, then during the tax hearing uh, next week, he'll communicate that well for us, I'm sure. Thanks. Any other board comments, questions? No, thanks again, uh, Mr. Richards. Um, you know, it's tough for, for a lot of folks. Um, I know as an accountant, governmental accounting was not, not my uh, favorite uh, part of the uh, uh, class, but uh, uh, those that understand it, it's, 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 it's amazing. But, again, the biggest difference in, in why we saw some of the, the higher numbers is, you know, you, you can't predict the future. We don't know if fuel prices are going to stay low, if they're going to go high. And if we don't budget for it, we can't spend it if the things change. So, again, we... We do monitor that very closely. Mr. Richards provides uh, buildings, grounds, and finance uh, with uh, regular updates on what our spending uh, is, uh, so that uh, you know we're we're really monitoring and being fiscally responsible for for the dollars we budgeted, uh, and hopefully not running up against those. So, great great effort by your team and and setting those where you know we shouldn't hit them, but uh, we if things change, we do have the wiggle room to adapt. Thank you. All right. Seeing no further comments regarding the budget hearing, I will adjourn the budget hearing at uh, 6 19 p.m. All right. Moving over to our regular agenda for this evening. Um,
We will move past section one call to order since we did that as part of the budget hearing. Moving on to section two communications. Uh, item A is our student council report. We get a welcome back our, our student council representatives from Papillion La Vista High School. Uh, I'll welcome up Marcy and Diana Ara. Did I get it? Was I close? <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, ladies. Hello. Um, we're just going to talk about a few updates for the start of the school year. Um, first up with uh, upcoming events. We have homecoming coming up. Uh, the homecoming game will be September 30th against Burke. Um, and then the, or the dance will be October 1st from 8 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. We also will have a homecoming pep rally for um, homecoming um, on September 30th. And we're excited about that because we haven't, you know, had normal pep rallies and stuff like that for a while. Um, we're also excited about our homecoming themes this year. They're a little bit different. Um, our theme for the dance is night in New York City. So we're, we're excited to start decorating and buying stuff for that um, through Student Council. And then for the homecoming week, uh, Monday, we're planning to do Country versus Country Club. Tuesday is dress as an adult. Wednesday is wearing pink. Thursday is anything but a backpack, which I think will be fun, a little unique. Um, and then Friday is spirit day, so wearing monarch gear. Um, in addition to upcoming events, we also have a lot of stuff happening in the fine arts. Um, with band, the Dallas Brass uh, group came and taught them a few things, and then they performed together for a concert. Um, and band will also have their first competition this weekend at Millard South. Uh, the vocal concert is coming up uh, September 22nd, and the fall play is also um, coming up, which will be Clue this year, um, and the casting for that was completed last week, so congrats to all of those roles. We also have some sports coming up. Uh, there was a softball tournament this weekend, um, at, or will be happening this weekend at Papio Landing, and then we will also be hosting at Monarchs the Allison Weston Volleyball Tournament on the 23rd through the 24th. So yeah, most of our full fall sports are in full swing and we're excited about that. Um, now DNR will talk about servant leadership within our school. All right, um, we wanted to touch up on the PL club and um, how we're moving on this um, school year. Um, we've currently started addressing mental health um, as this club is directed with um, or for the athletes of our school. Um, they've been touching up on the mental health of the athletes. And um, we have the ambassadors going up um, every game, you know, greeting the refs, uh, making them feel welcomed in our community. And we've even had some volunteer programs this fall. For example, um, Cross Country had the Cancer Run event at Porter Park, and uh, the golf supported our booster club for the golf outing. Um, our football team even went to the Food Bank of America and they managed to sell 850 pallets of food, which is um, pretty good. Uh, the volleyball team um, uh, with the YMCA went to the YMCA and worked with their youth campers. And our tennis team <coughs> welcomed students at La Vista West. Yeah, any questions about anything going on in our school? Yes. Let's not, I won't form a question. Okay. Make a statement. Okay. I want to know, I want to see some pictures of dress like an adult day. Okay. Because <laughs> I, yeah, because I mean, All right. you know, we, we got some good examples up yeah, here, but these yeah, are you know, good I mean, <laughs> so I just want to. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll just send some your way. All right. <laughs> I just want to say it's really good to have you back in the boardroom as school gets started. Yeah. You are so good about providing us with what's been happening, what's going to come up, and keeping us in the loop. So I really appreciate that student council from most schools takes the time to come to the board meetings when I know you have 500 other things you'd probably <laughs> rather be doing. So thank you so much for doing yeah. that for us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time. Anything else? Thank you. Nope, thank you. Again, you're always welcome to stay, but we know you've probably got plenty of homework to do. So <laughs> have a great evening. Thanks, ladies. Thank you. 
All right, moving on to item B under section two communications, public comment for items not on tonight's agenda. Uh, we do have three uh, submitted. Uh, again, uh, individuals may not exceed three minutes uh, for a total time of all speakers shall not exceed 30 minutes unless a majority vote of the board extends that allocated time. Again, when I call your name uh, to the uh, desk, uh, please state your name and address for the record. Uh, Ms. Branco has the timer. Uh, first ring is at two minutes, 15 seconds, uh, with the following one at that uh, limited uh, time of three minutes. Uh, first up for public comment for items not on tonight's agenda, uh, Ms. Lowen Eby. <coughs> Hello, my name is Lowen Eby. I reside at 1401 Edgewater Circle, Papillion, Nebraska, 68046. My comments are about the public records request production of text messages related to the Titan Performance Center and Policy 1409 fundraising. The text messages are on PapillionLaVistaCommunityForum.com. Here are some quotes. Dr. Rickley's text to Board President Mr. Brassfield. One thought to consider is if PL... SHS violated policy 1409, so did PLHS. The Monarch boosters raised in excess of $100,000 for weight room upgrades after the policy was approved. Text from Mr. Lotus, current board president running for re-election. More division between the schools. I still think we need to have a meeting with the leaders of both booster clubs about how major fundraising needs to work in the future. It must follow our policy. Dr. Rickley to Board President Mr. Brasfield. I think it would be a mistake adding this to the agenda unless we're prepared to have another round of 150 plus angry people. Dr. Rickley's text to Mr. Lotus. I think we offer Patty to put the Monarch Performance Center on next bond in two to three years and commit to supporting it, but not now. In closing, it seems Dr. Rickley made a mistake by not, by not going to the board prior to the commencement of fundraising for the Titan Performance Center in violation of policy 1409. This mistake took on a life of its own when the board did not take action. Then Dr. Rickley seems to be playing Monty Hall in Let's Make a Deal by offering a monarch performance center in the next bond. Offering construction projects to private citizens in bonds is not within the superintendent's scope of duties. The PLC board should have taken action in an open forum with full disclosure and transparency regarding the policy violation. The board's negligence has resulted in a loss of trust and confidence among the citizens. Please consider going to the town hall with PLCS board candidates Patricia Conway Boyd and Brittany Holtmeyer on Wednesday, uh, September 14th. Thank you. Thank you. Next up for public comment for items not on tonight's agenda, uh, Mr. Michael Kuchenmeister. Welcome. Hi. Uh, Michael Kuchenmeister, 10231 Smeron Woods Drive. Um, so I came here tonight uh, to talk about uh, LGBTQ policies in this district, but first I'm going to cover some facts. Uh, LGBTQ youth are more than four times as likely to attempt suicide than their peers, and this increased risk isn't directly because of how they identify. It's the stigma surrounding it or how they are treated and how they, or how they think they will be treated because of it. Research suggests only one-third experience parental acceptance. Another third experience parental rejection. The final third don't even disclose anything to their parents until they're adults. Um, furthermore, another study reported that high levels of parental rejection led to a six times increased risk of depression and eight times increased risk of attempting suicide. So fewer than one in three transgender and non-binary non youth on their home to be gender affirming and a little more than half on their school to be affirming. Research consistently indicates that having access to affirming spaces leads to lower rates of attempted suicide. Finally, research has shown the presence of just one accepting adult can reduce suicide risk by up to 40%. 
Um, so last year, a parent made a stink because they couldn't handle it when a teacher asked students how they wish to be addressed or their preferred pronouns. To most, this should be seen as nothing more than a polite question. However, to those students who have been struggling or have been trying to figure things out for themselves or to any student who already identifies as anything at, other than cisgender or heterosexual, this simple polite question signals an accepting, affirming adult, an ally. A student might then reach out to this teacher as a trusted adult in their lives, and this teacher might literally become a student's lifeline, especially if they don't feel that they live in a supportive, affirming environment at home. That student's risk of attempting suicide just dropped by up to 40% right there, just for that teacher being present. It's pretty clear we need to be supportive of our LGBTQ students and show them respect by addressing them how they wish to be addressed. But we also need to be supportive of those teachers who decide to make some, themselves available in a way that offers help and hope to some of these students. It's crucial to the health of our students that these teachers remain accessible and that our district does not get in the way. So before this school year officially kicked off, our district caved to these very few whiny parents and implemented a new verbal only policy that was communicated via a PowerPoint to our that our teachers are not to ask students for their preferred pronouns. Not only that, but in the event a student outs themselves to a teacher, that teacher is now instructed to get a counselor involved. Not 100% on this next part, but it's pretty unlikely the student's parents or guardians are also contacted. This is bad policy and it clearly endangers our students in our district. You might think a counselor is better trained to handle something like that. Well, maybe or maybe not, but it's not something that should be left up to the district. That should be left up to the student. The district is making the choice for them, and by doing so, they're removing the student's agency and harming the trust the student has in the teacher. This potentially puts that student at more risk. Contacting their home about it without the student's approval could be endangering them even further, especially if they live in an outright hostile home environment. It is not the district's business who a student wants to talk to about such deeply personal matters. It is not the district's business to out a student to anybody. Lastly, you're tying our teacher's hands here with this new policy if they attempt to do the right thing. I'll just skip to the end of that. Um, to those LGBTQ students out there, uh, you do have a community that affirms and supports you. And to those teachers who try to do the right thing, you have a lot more support than you think. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up for public comment on items not on tonight's agenda, Ms. Brittany Holtmeyer. Brittany Holtmeyer, 2007 Ridgewood Drive. Um, my topic was just uh, the public records request from two board meetings ago, I believe. Uh, when Ms. Fisher had said, as a board member who's been on the board for a long time, they rarely seen public records requests until these past couple years. So sitting back there wondering why, why just because of these past couple years have we seen more of them? I just think it's because of a lack of communication, transparency, and a trust issue. Um, emailing, not getting responses back, um, giving a phone call, not hearing back. So it leads to a public records request because somehow we have to get an information. Um, and it's not coming from just one person, it's coming from many. Um, another thing, that I had spoke to with, uh, Dr. Rickley about in a private meeting that we had, I told him the same exact thing, that it is a trust issue and it's a communication issue. Um, and with the whole trust, we also had brought up fake Facebook pages. And there has been many that are fake about myself and lies that are on them. And I don't know if you did see the Papillion Times, but there was a article about is Omaha becoming papillion and on there someone had written that and they gave false information and it was taken down because she requested it well dr. Rickley said that it's not the board 100% behind these pages it's not anybody within the district but he has an idea of who it is so since you do have an idea I'm asking that you do tell this person to take them down about me because there's false information about myself yes we did have a conversation about it and he did tell me this um, and just the whole thing with the trust issue, I did receive this t-shirt from a teacher who did resign this past year. And one of her top reasons is trust within the district and not being heard. And as you could tell from the presentation that was done last week about the survey that was brought in there. Um, and another thing is if we are having this much 
miscommunication between the board and the people, why not have an open town hall? Why not have like an open conversation uh, with your community members? I don't think it has to be a head to head, but I think it would be good for more clarification and maybe more of one on one time where you can ask questions. If you don't know an answer, go back and say, I don't know the answer, but I will try to look into it and I will let you know. So I am hosting one. And if anybody does have questions, I do invite them to come. And I do invite Sue Ann Witt to come and be on the panel with us because you're a top fan of mine on this fake Facebook page. And another one is Marcus Madler. You are welcome as well. And your wife this time doesn't have to lie about who she is. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes uh, item B under section two communications. Moving on to item C, uh, the superintendent's report. Dr. Rickley. Thank you very much, Mr. Lotus, members of the board. Happy Monday, everyone. To our audience members who are joining us, thank you for being here. We appreciate your attendance as well as those that may be watching at home on YouTube. Always appreciate you staying engaged with your local school district and our business. Uh, it is an exciting week, as we found out from our earlier report from our students from Papillion La Vista High School. It's homecoming week for Papillion La Vista South. Uh, they host Omaha Burke Friday night. The, the, the dance is uh, later that weekend. And then Monarch, as they indicated, follows up later the first week in October. So always a fun week around the district. It seems a little bit too early to be talking about homecoming, but here we are. Uh, also wanted to provide a shout out to the HR office for uh, what's become an annual event. Uh, we do a para-conference uh, where we provide much needed professional development and networking for our paras. And, and I'm going to beat Miss Witt to this and, and make a shameless plug. We're always, always looking for more paras. Uh, so for the paras that are already on staff, thank you for the incredibly difficult and valuable work that you do with our students every day. And for those of you that are even remotely interested in doing that work, please give us a call. We would love to sign you up. Uh, this year, the para conference is October 10th. The theme is I do it for the kids. Every year we do a different theme for the para conference. And it's just a wonderful opportunity to celebrate the good work that they do every day, as well as provide some training uh, as they work with our children. Uh, just wanted to remind the community that uh, Mr. Richards already pointed this out, but I think that this is very important to uh, circle back on since it's the first time we've held this. On September 22nd, we will have the first ever Sarpy County tax hearing, and these hearings will happen all across the great state of Nebraska. The purpose is basically for government subdivisions and, and those agencies with, with uh, levying authority to basically present their budget, to present their tax uh, levy for the upcoming year, uh, and to answer any questions there may be about it. So we're incredibly proud to host that event, 6.05 p.m. at Papillion La Vista South's auditorium. Uh, we we're told that the election commission expects hundreds of people. I think they're really trying to uh, get the word out to our constituents and taxpayers, so we'd love to see you there on the 22nd. Also wanted to uh, provide another shout-out for our leadership cohort. This is a, a group that Dr. Settles hosts every single year. Uh, I believe we have between 15 and 20 uh, participants, which is pretty typical. Uh, we have a lot of teachers in this district that aspire to leadership positions, not necessarily administrative positions, but leadership positions, and that can take on a lot of different forms. And this process, which was recently revamped, provides multiple opportunities for our teachers and our aspiring uh, leaders to learn from Brett Richards, for example, Shereen Siri, for example, uh, our district lobbyist, for example, when it comes to legislative matters. So it's a great opportunity for us to work with some of our young up-and-comers, and it's a great opportunity for them to be able to hopefully learn from some of our district leadership. Wanted to thank the board for a recent uh, meeting that we attended together. We had all six board members attend the NASB membership meeting, which was held here in La Vista. Uh, of all the school districts that were there in attendance, I think we were the only one that was batting 1,000 in terms of board uh, board participation. In fact, two of our board members were singled out with awards of achievement. Our own Skip Bailey and Sue Ann Witt were both singled out by NASB for these awards of achievement. So special congratulations to Mr. Bailey and Ms. Witt. Thank you for being there and for all six board members for uh, keeping me company. And on a more somber note, uh, the reason Miss Siri isn't here tonight, her mother Mary May passed away at the age of 84, um, lives in North Platte. Shereen's out there attending to the uh, funeral arrangements, which are tomorrow in North Platte. Uh, please keep Shereen and her family in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, Shereen did have an opportunity to say goodbye to her mom, which is obviously a blessing. So just please keep her family in your thoughts. And with that, Mr. Lotus, I conclude my superintendent's comments for the evening. 
Thank you, Dr. Rickley. Uh, moving on to board comments for this evening. Uh, well, I want to take a second since we just had a candidate accuse my wife of lying to her. Um, one, she went to that uh, Q and A because she's a citizen like anyone else. The last time that it was held, and she has been in this district for twenty plus thirty plus years, and had a lot of feedback on the SEL attacks that this candidate was saying to the board, and she was heavily involved in SEL and even presented in front of the board five years ago on SEL, and so wanted to to get some more information. My understanding on the, the situation is she in no way lied about who she was, which is a ridiculous claim um, to the candidate who now left, I see, uh, but in discussing on who she went to high school with said what her her maiden name is, so I just, I mean... I'd like to say I'm surprised uh, by the attack, but unfortunately I'm not. But I just wanted to clear the air because it's just I find it ridiculous that a board member has to be told that their spouse is uh, lying to them. It's just not the, not the time and the, the place, and I just wish that would get better around here. Um, so that aside, uh, so separately, Ms. Richards, I want to thank you for taking me through the tours of both the Papillion uh, middle school and La Vista Middle School on Fridays. It's been, I mean, I left, I uh, graduated from Papillion Middle and back when it was a junior high in 2001, it might have been the last time I was in that building or at least walked around that building. Uh, some of it was still the same. Uh, um, and you could tell that when I was there, we were still the Monarchs. You know, now they switched to the Titans, but you can tell they've they've tried to blend the old maroon Monarch coloring with the new blue Titan coloring which uh, it makes for some interesting uh, visuals with the, the maroon up against the blue. And La Vista um, Middle School, I can't remember the last time I was there either, but it's probably been at least 10 years since I walked around. So, again, I know we have uh, the upcoming uh, potential bond, a number of uh, items for both those middle schools uh, needing heavy renovations, so I just wanted to get a, a um, tour of those, so appreciate you taking the time for that. And that's all I have. I was just going to share that. So I talked a little bit at the last meeting about schools back in session, speeding in neighborhoods, running stop signs and things. I had the pleasure of talking to the Bellevue police, and they did a wonderful job of doing a couple weeks of, of posting officers out. Their goal is to just post them where they can be seen to help slow down the traffic. But they were able to hand out a few tickets while they were doing it. Uh, one that kind of surprised me is they just went right by the, the police officer. So I do think it really helps to do that. So if you do have a problem in your neighborhood, contact your local police. They do a wonderful job of making sure that those roads are safe for our students walking back and forth. I'm also pleased to announce that our ground down roads now are black topped and we do have our um, crosswalks back in place, which makes me feel a lot safer as well because it makes it very visible. I, I know it was difficult because they had to close the road up to the school the day they did the blacktop. Nobody could drive up that way. You had to come in the other, the other side. Um, it was a challenge driving through the neighborhood anywhere, but uh, people were overall, for the most part, kind to the, the workers, and we were able to get it done fairly. They were able to get it done fairly quickly. But it does help. Let your local police know if there's some issues going on with traffic in your neighborhood, especially as we have our kids out in force walking back and forth to school. Um, I think it, one of the things I was really pleased about the day they were getting ready to do in front of our street, they were actually helping the kids, the workers were actually helping people cross the street at a more safe location um, as they were doing some of that work. So I, I thought that was really impressive as well. So I just wanted to give a shout out. I think the police do a wonderful job and they're right there listening and helping you out when you have an issue. So I, I hope it's gonna make it safer in our neighborhood and it would do the same in others as well. So just wanted to comment on that. Nope, as Dr. Rickley noted, I mean, thank you again to all board members that attended the, uh, uh, I guess, area meeting uh, for NASB. Uh, always get a lot out of those those meetings. Um, I, I sat through uh, one on uh, Alley Cap, our, our district insurance provider, just in some best practices and, and things to, to be watching out for, um, you know, as we 
set policies or just, you know, friendly reminders uh, as we start to get into the uh, fall and winter season. You know, it's, it's typically slips, trips, and falls that uh, end up costing uh, lots of, of claims uh, to those providers. So they always want to remind us to, to make sure we're giving that safety, the safety announcements and taking care of our, our properties. Uh, and then I'm trying to remember the other one I went to. Did you do legislative? I did not do legislative. Oh, it's a session planning. Succession planning. Yes, yeah. Yep, succession planning. So they were very good. So I know we all split up so we could cover a majority of the topics. So, again, much appreciated. Um, attended uh, a couple middle school cross-country races over the last couple weeks. So I won just this evening. So a big shout-out to uh, Mr. Johnson over at Papillion Middle for hosting uh, a good event between our, our middles and a few uh, Bellevue middles as well. And Bellevue West hosted a really toasty meet uh, last Tuesday, um, but uh, really challenging course, but fun to see such good turnout uh, at our middle school sports. Um, uh, you know, we've got multiple teams for all the different volleyball squads around the district, uh, as well as football and, and cross country and things like that. So a lot of fun. Any further board comments, questions? some reason you kind of figured I would. Uh, but uh, they did a recap of what has happened in the past year and what we can expect that's going to happen in this coming year. And uh, I did find it very informative. Uh, but I still am very concerned about the fact that uh, the senators still think that they have to come into our board and dictate how we conduct business here. That is... Uh, the more I listen to him, the more I shake my head and wonder why. You know, if Washington was doing that to Lincoln, they would be upset. In fact, last year they were upset about one item. But they're doing it on a routine basis with us, and it, I don't know how we can get it stopped. But uh, the other one is the uh, media. The media is uh, very in this t uh, time and age because of this political situation and everything we that has to be uh, something that we have to uh, stay attuned to. The biggest benefit, and I enjoy the meetings and I learn a lot from them, but to think the biggest benefit is the fact that we have the interaction with the other boards and, and, uh, and the, the camaraderie that we have with each other is just amazing. So, look forward to it for next year's already. If one, one last thing that I spaced was um, I do, uh, Ms. Witt, I've got to get it. We just got notified today of uh, a maybe meeting on Wednesday. Uh, that's uh, the metro area uh, school boards uh, meet uh, on a monthly basis, kind of starting here in September uh, through uh, the end of the school year. So just we get reports on what uh, what's going on within each district, ideas that different boards have uh, and things like that. So it's a, another opportunity, as, as Dr. Tafoy said, to, to network with our fellow board members throughout the, the metro and, and see, uh, kind of find out what's, what's happening uh, across the area. So I'm looking forward to that uh, on Wednesday. All right, seeing no further board comments, we will conclude item D in section two communications, moving on to item E, uh, committee reports, building grounds and finance. Probably the budget hearing that we had, had tonight, and uh, the, uh, later on we will be discussing um, um, hmm, I drew a blank right there the general obligation bonds funds and everything and uh, very interesting meeting, a long meeting. But we'll be, you know, we'll be discussing the second part of that later on. Well, it was a great way to start a Friday. <laughs> that brought, brought donuts. He, he usually he, does. He he did. So. Uh, human resources and student services. No no meeting. Thank you, Ms. Witt. And American or curriculum and Americanism. We did meet since our last Board of Education meeting, and we will have things that will be on the agenda coming forward um, 
in the future. Uh, some discussion about state testing and those kinds of things. So we'll be seeing those as we go forward in future meetings. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. All right, that concludes Section 2 communications. Moving on to Section 3 action items. Uh, item A, action by consent. Motion to approve the action by consent agenda as listed. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Fisher and a second by Dr. Tafoya. Roll call, please. Yes. Dr. Tafoya? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. 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 Thank you. Moving on to item B, our board meeting minutes of August 22nd, 2022. Uh, I make a motion to uh, approve the uh, board, meeting minute, board meeting minutes as presented. Second. I have a motion by uh, Mr. Bailey and a second by Ms. Witt. Roll call, please. Mr. Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Thank you all. Moving on to uh, item C under section three uh, action items. Um, the discussion uh, regarding the issuance of the remaining $8.985 million of general obligation bonds as approved from the 2018 election. Mr. Richards. Thank you, Mr. Lotus. Um, I'll ask Mr. Cody Wickham to come up and uh, from D.A. Davidson, he didn't bring us much luck in Ireland, but, uh, you know, we're, we're, we got a, a new coach now after three games, and maybe if you'd have pulled out a victory for us out there in Ireland, it, we'd, we'd still be going strong, but no, just kidding. Um, no, but he's here to kind of give you an update on where we're at with that process and answer any questions you have uh, before uh, voting on that tonight. Yeah, thank you, Brett. Um, Cody Wickham with D.A. Davidson, 450 Regency Parkway, Omaha, Nebraska, 68135. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I'm honored to be in front of you all tonight and extremely grateful to be working with the district on this upcoming issuance. I, I thank you kindly. Um, I know Paul was here at your last board meeting and uh, provided uh, some information, so I'll try not to be too redundant. But I wanted to give you an update on kind of the market, where we stand, uh, the upcoming steps that we have left to take, and, and then um, kind of our timing going forward. Uh, last Thursday, uh, Mr. Richards and myself and Paul Grieger uh, had our ratings call with Moody's Investment Corp. Uh, the call went great. Brett did a great job of um, painting a good picture of the health of the district and the direction that you all are headed. So we expect to have uh, extremely good rating back from Moody's. Um, that's going to happen later this week. The other step that we have is um, the action item in front of you all tonight, and that's to approve the bond resolution to uh, allow authorize the issuance of the final sale of the bonds. Um, this the, the structure on this last piece, uh, obviously it's much smaller than the ones that you've dealt with in, in recent history here. So we looked at a number of options, um, anything from 20-year bonds to 10-year bonds, seven years, and uh, as short as two. And uh, ultimately we are in a, a rising interest rate environment, so we wanted to do what was best and most fiscally responsible. Uh, for the district and the taxpayers, and just to give you an idea of, uh, of what some of these scenarios and how they shook out, if we went with 20-year bonds uh, with just level debt service, uh, the total interest over the life of that issuance was over $4.1 million in interest expense. On a 10-year bond, the interest was uh, over $1,680,000. Uh, the model that we ultimately landed on, we're looking at less than $350,000 in interest expense. So. Um, basically, the structure that you all are going with is, is an excellent one for the district and the taxpayers, and it's going to save you a lot of money uh, in, in, the, in the long run. Um, I will say Moody's agrees with the structure. Uh, we kind of explained our thinking behind it, um, and, and they like the plan going forward. So, again, we'll, we'll hear back from them on Thursday. We have everything else ready to go to hit the market. Um, going to market on a Friday isn't always ideal. Um, it's not, um, uh, not, not the biggest audience uh, on a Friday afternoon. So the plan is to go out with a preliminary pricing period next Monday, the 19th, and then have our order period on Tuesday, the 20th. That will allow us to have all the interest rates locked in and everything finalized before the Fed meets the following day on Wednesday, the 21st, where it's expected to have another rate increase with almost certainty. So we'll have uh, the rates locked in and everything will be finalized. We won't actually close the issuance until uh, right now I have uh, just, 
I have in there for uh, October 10th, but once the bonds are sold, the interest rates won't change. So we actually, you won't start paying interest on those until October 10th when we close on it. Uh, we really can't go much beyond 30 days, so that just seemed to be a good date that works. Um, uh, but again, you'll have everything finalized before the Fed meets next Wednesday. Any board comments or questions for Cody? Uh, I'll make the motion to approve the attached resolution in the amount not to exceed eight million nine hundred eighty-five thousand to facilitate the remaining build, building schedule for the 2018 bond projects during the 2022-23 fiscal year and beyond, as presented. All right. I have a motion by Mr. Madler and a second by Dr. Tafoya. Any further board comments? Seeing none, and seeing no. Uh, public comments requested over this item. Uh, roll call, please. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Cody. Just a reminder, Mr. Fisher. Just reminded me that, again, uh, please don't leave. Uh, we all need to sign this resolution uh, this evening. I'll remind folks uh, again later on as well. All right, that concludes Section 3 action items. Moving on to Section 4, our discussion and information item uh, for this evening. I'll welcome up Ms. Iman to discuss uh, our facility planning update. So uh, Mr. Richards and I are going to tag team this. Um, what we thought we would do um, tonight is go through the presentation that we're going to take out to our staff and to our community about our facility needs so you all can see that and ask questions and make sure that we're all on the same page um, before we start to take this out publicly. Um, the purpose of the presentation, and I've shared this with all of you several times, but really the goal of where we are with this process right now is really to collect community feedback and feedback from our staff. Um, so the big things that we're going to be looking for is um, do we need a future bond issue? If so, what's the timing of that bond issue? And more specifically, I think the thing um, that we really want feedback on is what are the projects that our community and our staff believe need to be included in um, the facility needs proposal. So how did we get to this point? And you all know this, um, but just to bring everybody up to speed, um, it started with the growth study of RSP, and I'm going to share a little bit of that um, here in a second. Um, there were a lot of discussions with um, building administrators, walkthroughs done um, at the schools to really I to start to identify where our facility needs. Um, our architect also did a needs assessment and walked through several of our buildings. Um, we went through that with the Buildings and Grounds Committee several times. And then the piece that I think was really helpful um, in this process is that we took a very, 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 very preliminary proposal out to the staff of those buildings that were going to be impacted by this proposal and got more detailed input from them. And it was really um, that feedback from our staff that really helped shape what these final projects um, at this point are looking like. And then, of course, all of you were involved along this, the various stages of that process. So there's three main areas um, that we're focusing on in this facility needs proposal. Um, improving safety and security is, of course, um, high importance and is at the top of the list. Um, accommodating a growing student population. And then probably the biggest impact of this proposal is just maintaining that standard of greatness in our facilities and making sure that um, we don't have brand new facilities that are um, the shining bright light of our school district and older facilities that aren't very shiny bright lights. Um, but to bring all of our facilities to a certain standard um, and make sure that no matter where you go to school, you feel really good about the school that you're attending. A little bit about the historical enrollment and what we've seen, and I think it's really important. I think I've got a 
Do I have a pointer? I do. I think it's really important as you look. I mean, our trend line as a school district, the historical enrollment clearly goes up um, and will continue to go up. But we've had these blips along the way. This blip here was a, a situation that happened at the base. We had a little blip there. Um, we had a big blip um, for our school district because if you'll see this trend line that we had going um, really strong here during the last bond issue, we had this blip right here during COVID. Um, we dropped almost 300 students during COVID. A lot of those were to um, homeschool. Um, we saw that in where our students left. We, had, we lost students and we didn't gain many students at all. You will see from we are now starting to recover. We had a, a small step up last year, and then again this year we've had a little step up. I think the thing that's really important is that we do feel like this trend line is going to continue. Um, why do we think that? Well, um, we Ms. Pay Ivan, before you move off yes. that slide, I think since the statement was made earlier, I just think we just need to be crystal clear about this. The district enrollment is not declining. We no. saw a drop during the year of the pandemic, as virtually all public school districts across the country did, but we have seen modest growth following that period, and we anticipate modest growth as we finalize our numbers for the last September. And, and, uh, for last Absolutely, year. and I do think another thing that's important to say about this, all of these numbers are the last Friday in, se last Friday in September. Last Friday in September. Um, this one is not because we're not there yet, so this number may change slightly. Um, once we get to that, this number, the 11,671 is current enrollment as we have it registered today. So why do we believe that that trend is going to continue to go up? Um, well, the company that we hired from Kansas City that came in and looked at growth trends and everything that was happening in our society says um, that um, we're going to continue to grow. Um, maybe not necessarily at the same rates, um, that we had seen in the past, but particularly at the elementary level, we're going to continue to see um, that growth. That growth might flatten out a little bit more at the middle school and high school, but um, at the elementary level, we absolutely are going to continue to see that growth. And this next chart, this is the district boundaries, um, and you can see all of these red areas are areas that are currently being developed um, where we are anticipating students um, will come from all of these homes. Most of our growth is on this western end of the school district. Um, and you'll talk, you'll see here, this area right here, which feeds to Prairie Queen, is, is one of the high areas that we're con most concerned about with the growth and the numbers that we're seeing. The purple line on the bottom um, is our current district boundary. Um, and then all of these areas are areas like this area right here is currently graded. All of these areas are areas that are part of that agreement that we have a Springfield Platte view that will be coming into our school district. So those will eventually, as they developed, um, will be, become a part of the Papillion Vista Community Schools. So I don't think that there's any question based on the study that an outside agency did, as well as what we're seeing from just what's happening in our community, that the growth is, is absolutely coming. So one of the things that we have in this proposal are growth projects. Um, you'll see one of those um, projects is a new elementary school. That new elementary school is projected to be, we've already got the land for that um, new school. That was included in the last bond issue, which is a trend that we've been doing. We've tried to buy the land ahead of time because land is becoming more, less and less accessible in our school district just because of the growth. Um, so this is the floor plan that we've continued to use for our buildings um, for some time. We have um, thoughts in this proposal for additional land. Um, we do, middle schools are hard to come by just because of the amount of land that you need for that. So we do have, um, we are thinking money in this proposal for, to purchase a middle school site as well as an additional elementary school site. So we are just, just a little bit, you're setting future boards up to be prepared for future growth that's coming. I do think it's important to remember with our elementary schools, we, we have held very tight um, in this community to that neighborhood school concept. Um, at the elementary school, we're not busing kids across town um, to elementary buildings, but we really try to have those 
um, elementary schools in the neighborhoods. Um, so kids can mostly walk to school at the elementary level. Um, that's why those buildings are built to three section buildings. Um, Prairie Queen is a good example. Prairie Queen is projected to be significantly more than a three section building. Um, because of the growth that's feeding into that building. Um, but we know once we build another school and that neighborhood starts to flatten out, about 400 is the prime area for those neighborhoods when they start to flatten out. They peak above that, but then they flatten out. So that's the philosophy that um, we continue to have. And then I also think it's really important in this board, and we've got a couple of board members that have been on here for a long time that remember this, but... Um, it's to the money in this is to purchase the land only and if we decide that then we don't need that land down the road we can always sell that land um, so it's not we're not committed to keeping that land and it can only be a school site but we can sell that land and this board has done that in the past um, other gross things that we have in this proposal would be technology infrastructure we continue just as we add more and more computers we continue to stress the network in our district um, uh, Mr. Lucas also wanted to make sure that we needed additional infrastructure to support the safety and security measures, additional intercom systems, the cameraing system, all of that, make sure that we have the infrastructure to support that safety and security stuff as well. Elementary projects, you'll see um, the elementary projects we're going to go through here, and I'm going to flip it over to Mr. Richards here in a second, are really designed around those three areas again. It's that growth, it's the safety and security, and then that standard of greatness. Oops, sorry, Brett. Oh, yeah, no <laughs> uh, I'd, have, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Pat Carson if he wouldn't mind to come up to... Oh, sit with sorry, him. I skipped He's that. with BCDM, and you guys know sorry, him well. Sorry, Pat, I invite you to the meeting, You're and then don't include you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to need those. Thank you. Yeah, he's been part of the team helping develop this and can answer any questions that I can't for sure. And he gives a little historical perspective to the district, too, with any questions you might have in the district uh, with previous projects. Um, but the, let's just start with the elementary schools updating to a standard. And uh, we heard that throughout the feedback sessions with our staff when we went out in the spring. <coughs> And uh, the expansion of smaller classrooms was a big deal to them. At Parkview, Terra, and Trumbull, they, they feel like their classrooms are uh, not big enough uh, to do the things they'd like to do within the classrooms and have a quality learning environment. The board had started that process with uh, G. Stanley Hall, La Vista West as an example, uh, where uh, there's additions that are put on the schools and then the other classrooms inside are renovated and expanded uh, to, to create that. And at Parkview, Terra, and Trumbull, we propose that we continue that trend and thought to update to that standard. Uh, interior renovations of school that include paint, carpet, tile, lighting, restrooms, uh, get after the media center and intercoms and wireless clocks uh, in the building. And then with exterior improvements, exterior windows, uh, they're way past their prime uh, in these th three buildings. Um, a new roof in each of these three buildings. Um, and then exterior infrastructure improvements, uh, oh, and I mentioned the roof, um, some of those are already listed, but including HVAC and generators as well. And then, you know, being a safety issue that we talk about, and they are not cheap, is the playground uh, resurfacing, um, which we want to try to do with the current five elementaries that are in the current bond right now as well. Um, so we hope to have all our elementaries uh, resurfaced here in the next few years, over the next three, three years or so. And then, you know, I thought uh, we had a great discussion at the board retreat on safety and security items. Uh, with things that are going on in public schools nowadays, and all schools nowadays for that matter, um, you know, looking at some safety and security items. And uh, that could be anything from bulletproof uh, film that goes over glass. Uh, it could be alert systems to exterior doors that, are, that need technology to happen. Uh, so all of those discussions will consider, uh, continue throughout this process, and we'll get good feedback from our public on those issues as well throughout uh, this process. So just looking at Terra Heights and so what that would look like uh, generally at these three schools, uh, the picture in the right-hand corner is the addition uh, in blue. So we would make that additions on uh, two sides of the building to accommodate for the expansion of classrooms. So we don't anticipate any additional classrooms necessarily at Terra, Heart, Terra Heights, just more square footage for those classrooms to be in. Uh, the site work, uh, the red, is the playgrounds that we talked about, the resurfacing of those. Um, the green would be the significant 
renovations in this process that would be touched to expand. I think some of those classrooms right there are in the upper 600 square footage wise, if I remember right. Yeah. Um, and we want to try to get those closer to 800 or more square feet per classroom like our newer schools are getting uh, today. And then the yellow is we're going to get in there and kind of upgrade the uh, lighting, tiles, um, flooring, um, paint, and those types of things just to bring it up to um, a modern educational environment. Trimble Park, same thing. Uh, green significant in re renovation there. Uh, the addition out the back uh, was about the only place that Pat could find to put that over at Trumbull <laughs> Park, and there's a few of those uh, um, places that we're going to be talking about in the next school, too, uh, trying to find space for these additions on these smaller sites that have been around a long time or are a little bit more difficult, uh, but needed. Um, so uh, it's kind of that trend with the site work and the playgrounds. You can see in the right-hand corner with the additions and the re rubber resurfacing of the playgrounds, and then the green significant and then the yellow touching as well. So the whole school, all three of these schools are getting touched uh, throughout. Parkview Heights, uh, found room um, out the back for this one uh, to get some additional square footage uh, to keep bring, I, I know these are some of the smallest classrooms we have in the district uh, at Parkview Heights. Uh, so trying to get those bigger is good. Um, and then going through and, and renovating the rest of the school. Elementary projects continued. These are a little bit different. Hickory, Walnut, Portal, Patriot, and Bell. Um, besides Hickory, four of those five schools are pretty new. I mean, from that standpoint, as far as within 20 years uh, or so, I think one of, one of them might be a little older than that. Uh, but a lot of the same things are needed as far as safety and security improvements. That These are the last five schools that have not been uh, touched for the front entry, the changes that would have been made at all the other schools in the district. Uh, so this bond would address that. The finishing kitchen expansion, so we're able to serve more than one entree at those elementary schools, and they actually have a kitchen they cook in uh, for the kids at those five schools. And then there's permanent wear, getting rid of the styrofoam and things like that. Uh, that, that kitchen allows that to happen. Um, the interior updates, we would go in and refresh these five schools. Uh, yeah, after 15 years, you know what your home, and you can imagine in the school those things start to go go bad. Uh, carpet gets worn and, um, you know, ceiling tiles and uh, a lot of other things need upgrading. And we are, within this process, looking to upgrade all our lighting to LED, uh, which saves in energy and gives a much more brighter environment for kids to learn in. Uh, so, and we've been on the process of that in some of our other schools when Doug Lewis was here even, uh, trying to get LED, replacing some of the standard lighting throughout the district. Um, you know, after the, that long, too, there's a lot of technology upgrades that need to happen with network wiring, server closets, you know, and intercom systems in these schools as well, and then those safety and security items that I mentioned earlier. Hickory Hill, um, kind of what that would look like with the front entrance, uh, the, um, um, some repurposing of space uh, with special education in the front office uh, in this, and some additions to get that finishing kitchen on uh, there is shown in the blue. Walnut Creek, some of these schools you'll see as prototypes. So uh, Walnut Creek, Portal, Patriot, the school, or Portal uh, will go through here, but this is almost like a carbon copy of what was done at Rumsey Station uh, in the last, and what we're currently doing at Rumsey Station actually. Uh, adding on a finishing kitchen, got to add a kindergarten classroom for the third section of kindergarten, um, that front entry office, and then repurposing the old office into special education rooms. Exact same project. Portal, same thing. Uh, and we're going to touch those playgrounds as well um, with, the, with the rubber resurfacing of these buildings as well. Uh, Patriot, um, they do have that third section of kindergarten already, so no need for an addition for a classroom on this one. But the other thing, we'd have the finishing kitchen in the back and the front office uh, um, thing that we just talked about, and Bell, same same deal. But we do want to get in there and, and renovate the rest of the buildings uh, to bring them up to a standard for a learning environment. Pat, did you want to add anything on these as I'm going along? No, you're doing Okay, so if you, I mean, if you're thinking about something, I'm, well, it's no. not talking about this yet, but. <laughs> okay, we'll keep going then. Uh, middle school projects. Um, and, you know, there were some things done uh, at both of these middle schools that we're going to talk about, Papillion Middle, and La Vista Middle, 
uh, where we did some things with the cafeteria and the finishing kitchens and the front entrance uh, it, back in a bond, probably, I'm guessing, around 2012, 13. Uh, at that particular time, they look great. Uh, we're just trying to get back in there to update that, uh, that renovation. So, for example, the science rooms in both of those buildings are from when it was originally built. Uh, the Bunsen burners aren't working. The cabinets are uh, dilapidated. So trying to get in there and really get after the science rooms, the art rooms, uh, reconfiguring learning center spaces. Uh, La Vista Middle doesn't have a counseling center, so adding on a counseling center to La Vista Middle. Uh, interior renovations of schools, we talked about all this. Uh, both schools need gym bleachers and Papillion Middle a little bit more with the gym. Uh, we had the storm over here at La Vista Middle that gave us a lot of updates there with the new floor, new roof, uh, those types of things at La Vista Middle. Uh, we didn't get that at Papillion Middle. So uh, that that uh, gym, I, as I said, it was ancient because I actually played basketball in, the, in junior <laughs> high. So it's, it's been a long time. Um, track stadium updates. Uh, the track, and as we talked about, they got about a 20-year to 25 if you push it life. Both of those tracks are over 30 years old. And so when we can resurface those things, uh, just to give you an example out of Foundation Field, it's sitting about 17, 18 years old on that track. We're already starting to get some sub issues underneath. Uh, so we can resurface it, and then the cracks are still going to come up through because the infrastructure underneath those uh, just don't last that long. They're about 20 to 25-year life. Uh, probably giving it too much credit at 25 years. Um, so going in and doing some track stadium updates at both of those two schools, um, at, uh, updating the technology infrastructure, we talked about that, fire alarms, intercoms where needed, um, exterior inter infrastructure improvements, replacing roofs, windows uh, that need it, HVAC, generators. Uh, there are generators in those buildings that are outdated and need replacing. And then, again, that safety and security piece that we'll figure out along the way, which we'll have great discussion in the community on. And just kind of a look at those plans uh, from a site level and a blueprint level. Um, so the addition on the counseling center out the kind of the south side of the building uh, there. We will be doing some sidewalk uh, work around the back too, according to fire code. Uh, the fire marshal would really like to see that done. Um, the green areas are significant renovation with the science rooms and then the learning center areas and then touching the areas that haven't been touched. So there has been some things done for sure in this building that's been really good and positive. Papillion Middle, same thing, science rooms up top. We'll hit the art room, media center, uh, the gym especially uh, with the equipment in there and the flooring and the bleachers and the lighting, the roof, uh, just about everything within that gymnasium and then try to get in there and update the other areas as well throughout the building. Then high school, and you'll notice, you know, I think this, this bond issues or proposal would be a lot different. Uh, the high schools are incredible. Uh, the, the things that were done to the high schools in the last bond are exceptional. Uh, we want to kind of finish a few of those things, and then um, and we'll get to those projects here. So renovation of the fine arts auditorium areas. Uh, you know, South is in a little better condition. They did some recovering of the seats a few years back. Um, that made that in excellent condition. Um, stage floor replacements in both buildings, sound and lighting enhancements um, and upgrades. Uh, seating replacement and ADA compliance at uh, Papillion La Vista High School. Uh, we do have some of those issues off the drama room with ADA compliance with back in their dressing rooms and uh, um, classroom area. And then adding storage space of about 400, is it 400 square feet, Pat? Oh, there yeah. 600. 600. 600. 600. 600 square feet of storage at both buildings uh, will be uh, much appreciated, I think, by what we've heard from staff over there. And then, you know, we, we've, we've heard a lot about the PE activity turf space at Monarch um, and Titan Center. Uh, so, you know, we spent a lot of time, and I'm being newer in this district just over a year, and I've been able to take a good look at it, too, with Dr. Rickley and our administration. Buildings Grounds Finance Committee, Fred, Marcus, and Brian, has spent a great deal of time going around looking at each building. The architects have really helped us compare square footage and uses within those buildings. And we just found uh, throughout the whole process that adding a PETA, PE activity turf space at Monarch uh, will get us closer to equitable. It's different, uh, but we could get the same uses uh, by doing that over at Monarch. About 6,400 square feet out the north side of the new gymnasium there. 
Um, and we'll show you that here in a minute on the blueprint. On the blueprint. Uh, and then, you know, Monarch now has something that South doesn't, which is a f another flex classroom within their building. Uh, so trying to come back over at Titan and <clears throat> bring about 2,600 square feet of a flex classroom space used for things like academies, health class. Uh, we're talking uh, you, athletic you, you training, got these down. the yeah. leadership academy, yeah. <laughs> leadership academy stuff, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely athletic training, those types of things. So, and then lastly, uh, you know, coming in, uh, and I've, I've always had, a, I'm a Sarpy County person from Bellevue, and I've always had a lot of respect for Papillion La Vista Community Schools. Uh, and their excellence in academics and facilities and the whole works and over the years. And, and I think there's one area in the activity program we really got to look at, and that is the baseball softball complexes uh, that used to be probably pretty darn good in the Monarch side. And then the Titan sides kind of come up from scratch. It used to be practice fields, and then they kind of converted over to game fields. Uh, so getting in there and working with the cities um, and trying to get equitable fields on both sides that can compete at a Class A level uh, to keep our students at, uh, in the buildings and wanting to be part of those proud programs that we have at both schools. So there's the blueprint, kind of looking at it from a site plan. You can see the uh, drone view off to the right uh, where that blue would be for the new uh, turf area for Monarch. Um, and then with a vestibule, in, vestibule entry and then the green areas uh, would also be the auditorium that we get in there and touch, and then the storage area out the back of 600 square feet. Papillion La Vista South, uh, right now, and we're still working with the administration on this, the best place it looks to put that uh, additional flex classroom of 2,600 square feet would be on the south side of the building. So the academic corridor, as well as the athletic corridors have access to that because uh, it could be dual use for a lot of different things within the building that they desperately need that space. And I know we did some flex learning uh, in the last bond that really is helping with the testing environments and those types of things, and just having an additional space for meeting uh, for larger groups would be very helpful. Non-instructional space there with the fields. Uh, you know, we're going to be meeting with the, the more city. We've had some discussions last spring with city officials on uh, the two Monarch fields, uh, one at La Vista City Field and then at Fricky Field. And we're having some continued, their, their fiscal budget's on a little bit different cycle, so uh, we look forward to the meetings here in the next couple of weeks with, with the heads there, Dr. Rickley and I, have uh, set up some meetings. Thank you, Kathy, for doing that. Um, and then lastly, uh, as part of the proposal, the Young Adult Transition Program we currently house up by Head Start off Gold Coast Road. Uh, in a storefront, uh, we're running out of space. We got about 6,600 square feet up there uh, with all the staff and students we have in wheelchairs. Uh, we just feel like it's not gonna be a good um, space for us in the future, and we're currently leasing that. Um, that lease is done after this year. Now, depending on how the, this process goes, we'll have to look at something for after this year already, um, but um, maybe we can just add to a lease or two, year or two lease to, until we could get a building done if the voters so approve. Um, and there it is. We, we got land already for it. Uh, we got a, land, a lot of land out there at Liberty, and there's a great space off to the west side uh, that we could put that building. Um, so right now we're, that's kind of, and, and getting feedback from the public on this for you guys would, will be really good. Finances, always the big thing here. So the financial goals with a bond dropping off after this year, um, we think we have the budget capacity, the levy capacity to have the levy say the same. And Cody Wickham was just here, and he helped us kind of figure that out on how we could do that uh, with a new bond. So we could say this could be a no-tax increase. Um, the estimated cost for each project, you can see it's very elementary school heavy, uh, about $86, $86 million dollars. Uh, in, or $84 million, I'm sorry, uh, in there for elementary school, a new one, and then the old elementary school is getting updated. And the junior high is, is getting hit hard. Those two that are the older ones, Liberty, of course, is in great shape. Um, high school projects would be smaller this time, about an estimated $13 million, uh, with new land purchases, uh, 5.7, and then uh, up to $1 million in technology infrastructures, and then the young adult transition program project at $5 million. So total cost for this bond, yes, they're a little higher than we wanted uh, with construction costs going up the way they are. 
And Pat, you, are we still about 25, 30% in construction costs uh, yeah. increase? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we're starting to see that level out. We've, in the last couple of months, we've bid work for a number of other local districts, and thankfully, it's leveling out, but it's it's incredibly high, even based on, on the last project that we would have bid for the district, which would have been La Vista West. Um, it's growing quite a bit, but... Um, yeah, so we hope, and, you know, I will say this, and, and we'll hear this throughout the process, and in my years, and you will know better than I, uh, construction costs tend to not go down over time. Uh, once they're up there, they like the prices they got, and they typically don't bring them down. So that's, you know, that's a consideration in this whole thing, the current construction costs, but at the same time, they are leveling out. Uh, we don't anticipate they'll just drop all of a sudden. Uh, for our well-being. That would be nice. If it, yeah. if it, they, they go up and they come down just a little bit, and then they level out. Okay. Somewhere down the road, they'll go up again. Questions, comments? Each high school has 99 factors, right? Uh, I don't have the exact amount of that. That's what I have to okay. believe. What was that? Pardon? I believe when we added the freshman wings at both buildings with this latest renovation at Monarch and Titan, I believe they have an equal number of classrooms. Now, I believe the additions uh, made that equal. I think we were one or two off prior to the renovation. I believe we're equal, but we can check on that for you to make to be sure. Okay. Uh, that's what I was led to believe anyway in the last few years. Um, the other thing is the footprint of both high schools as far as square footage what is the difference between the two with the additions that you're talking about today? The with, whole yeah, building? Or, yeah, uh, the, the two high schools. The flex addition in the south and the, uh, and the turf space at, uh, at Lawnark. So you're asking just about the PE square footage? Yes, the or, PE or the total footage. Okay. square footage of the of the whole building dock, or just the, the the PE space spaces that we're contemplating. Which one are you? Well, asking? I was asking for the, uh, the, the the PE. Oh, just the PE. Got it. Okay. Let me pull that up real quick. <clears throat> so the turf area at Papillion South is sixty four hundred and five square feet. Uh, PE classroom um, with the weights right adjoining to it that's open is another 3475. Uh, the flex space uh, that we'd like to bring in would be 2600. Uh, the weight room off to the side itself of the current weight of the new weight room is 3735 square feet, and then they have a cl cl health classroom about 840 square feet. At Monarch, uh, we currently have a weight room with a slice of turf in there at 4,135 square feet. The flex classroom space that was just finishing up and had an uh, inspection here today, uh, or tomorrow I think it is, 2,880 square feet. Um, their current weight room, that's an older weight room, there is 3,640 square feet. Um, so basically if we put 6,400 turf area at Monarch, we put 2,600 of that flex classroom that, Mon uh, that Monarch has at South. We'd be at about 17,000 square feet per building. Per building. Per building. So basically comparable. Very comparable at that point. Right now, Monarch's is short, probably about 3,800 square feet in those in this particular area. Uh, I want to thank the team for putting it all together and that you and you two and I know the rest of the admin. Um, I know uh, that this has had, you know, this is the initial proposal at this point. It's gone even already through uh, a lot of iterations. Uh, and hopefully the staff appreciates you guys getting out in front of them well before it gets to this point so you can revise based on their feedback. I know a number of things were removed and added in based on that feedback. Um, so hopefully they appreciate that and continue to pro provide the feedback. Uh, um, I'm excited. There's a lot in there. I know there's a lot to digest, uh, and I know there's going to be a lot more information that goes out. Uh, I'm excited for the community feedback to get their feedback when you guys do those sessions in the high schools and go to the different groups. 
Uh, so I look forward to seeing all the feedback on them, but just want to say thanks for putting it all together over the months and months and months and dwindling down to get to the, you know, the high priority issues because obviously you can't do everything you want to, especially with the costs going up. Uh, I know things have had to get cut because the, the, uh, the dollar amount just got to a point um, where you didn't want to get, get it too high. Uh, so thanks for putting all the time and effort into it. We'll get that schedule of all the community meetings now that we're to this point finally. Um, then we'll get the schedule of when all the staff and the community meetings are and we'll get that out to all of you so you can attend whatever you want to. I, th I think Marcus's point's a really good one and I think it bears repeating for the community that this, la this list that's been presented is by no means etched in granite. It, it is a list and it has gone through several steps of vetting as Marcus indicated, but if past history is any guide, uh, we could have projects added to the list and we could have projects taken away from the list. And I'll harken back to the 2018 bond initiative. We're probably the single biggest point of conversation as we did this community engagement was the swimming pool itself. And I think what we heard very clearly was that while we thought that was a good thing, it potentially endangered the whole bond. There probably, probably wasn't enough support to carry the day on some of the other projects on the list. So we took it off. Uh, I think it's very likely we may have similar conversations this go around. So that's the whole value of this engagement process. Some projects could get added, taken away. But I want to thank Brett and Annette for putting in a ton of work on this. Uh, it will get further refined as we take this out to the community. And I also want to thank Pat and BCDM. Pat literally sat down with us for the better part of three hours with Cabinet and went through this slide by slide. And we said, hey, can you modify that? Can you add this? Can you take away that? And uh, Pat's been nothing but uh, a gracious partner. So, Pat, thank you so much for everything you do to support so, the district. No, this is the biggest thing for uh, for me that uh, Brett was well aware of, as the the nerdy accountant uh, at the table was uh, no tax increase. You know, how do we find a way to keep the standard that we set for this district in terms of you know high quality uh, educational facilities? Uh, but also be mindful that, you know, it is taxpayer dollars. And though there are lots of wants, uh, you know, can we address the needs and then, you know, get into the wants of each building. And it's great to get that feedback of, you know, the really key issues at the individual buildings. So well done on that. But, again, uh, good work with Cody. Cody presented uh, some just situational ranges to buildings, grounds, and finance uh, a few meetings ago just on what wiggle room did we have in terms of total bond uh, ask and what that would do potentially to the levy. So, again, uh, great work uh, to keep it uh, tax neutral. Uh, any other comments, questions? All right, seeing none, seeing no public comment regarding this item. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Annette. Thanks again, Thank Pat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richards. All right, that concludes uh, Section 4, Discussion Information Items. Uh, before we move on to Section 5, uh, it is, there is a potential for that being an uh, executive closed session. Um, I'll, I'll bring forward uh, Section 6, our future board calendar, uh, to address that first. Uh, September 17th, uh, that is Saturday, correct? Uh, is the Papillion Vista South Homecoming Dance. Uh, with obviously the homecoming football game on Friday night. Uh, September 20th, 2022, I have a liaison lunch at my old elementary. Uh, finally glad to get back into that building with all the renovations I haven't seen. Uh, September 22nd, uh, 2022, as, as Dr. Rickley and others have noted, the county tax hearing at Papillion La Vista South High School uh, Auditorium at 6.05 p.m., I think it was noted. And September 26, 2022, the next Board of Education meeting at 6 p.m. here at the central office. Did you say five? It's branded six. It's, I know, and then one of the slides, it said 6.05. So it's it's 6.05. It had to be after 6 o'clock, so you can't start before 6. I didn't know. Is that in the state statute? I think it might be. That it has to be after 6 p.m.? Okay. <laughs> I mean, we got to follow the statutes, so so be it. All right, moving back up to uh, 
Section 5. Uh, the next items on the agenda are the presentation of, a, of an appeal of Superintendent Rickley's decision in a student discipline matter, and, and then the review and deliberation of that appeal. Superintendent Rickley, in your opinion, is the discussion of these items in closed session necessary to prevent the needless injury to the involved students' reputations and to prevent the needless disclosure of confidential information from the student education records? I believe it is, Mr. President. Thank you. Superintendent Rickley, was the involved student notified that the board may consider the presentation of appeal, review the appeal, and deliberate in closed session? Yes, there was no objection on behalf of the student to this matter being considered in closed session. All right, to the board. Is there a motion for the board to enter closed session to hear the presentation of an appeal of student, Superintendent Rickley's decision in a student discipline matter and then to review that appeal and deliberate regarding it in order to prevent the needless injury to the involved students' reputations and to prevent the needless disclosures of confidential information from the student records. I also move and also note that the closed session is further necessary in order to permit the board to receive legal advice with respect to these agenda items and the underlying appeal. Second. All right, I have a motion by Ms. Fisher and a second by Mr. Madler. Any board comments, questions, discussion regarding? All right, seeing none, roll call, please. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Bailey. Yes. Ms. Webb. Yes. Mr. Madler. Yes. Mr. Yes. Ms. Fisher. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. The board has adopted a motion to enter closed session to hear the presentation of an appeal of Su Superintendent Rickley's decision in a student discipline matter and then to review that appeal and deliberate regarding it in order to prevent the needless injury to the involved students' reputations and to prevent the needless disclosure of confidential information from the student education records. Closed session is further necessary in order to permit the board to receive legal advice with respect to these agenda items and the underlying appeal. The board will limit itself, and again, I remind the board, we will limit ourselves to discussion of this issue and this issue only. Uh, to prevent the appeal, to present the appeal, the board invites the student and or his or her representatives to stay. I'll ask for all other parties uh, not involved to please.